Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 117th meeting of the Carl Hess Club, which started in this very room. Uh, before we uh, get going with, um, with uh, all the activities we have scheduled for today, I want to announce that you get a special extra bonus just for showing up here today. Uh, where is Farley? Right here. Farley. Okay. Uh, this is, the person who's taking the picture of me right now is A. Farley Howell, who is the, um, who brought with her today a memorial edition, which she's going to be passing out to everybody here, of the New Libertarian Manifesto. So uh, there is a special edition just for, just for this uh, event today. Everybody's going to get one. So. How many people actually are here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, this isn't so organized, I can give you an exact count right now. I'll figure that out with the restaurant a little later. <laughs> but um, I, think we, I think we've got it. I'm pretty sure we have enough to go around. But um, anyway, this is a very special thing. And we'd like to pay tribute to John Fast, who is the uh, benefactor who, um, uh, who financed the publishing of this memorial edition of the New Libertarian Manifesto, and who financed Farley's air ticket so she could express it out here to this event. Uh, I'm going to introduce Mike Everling to um, basically handle announcements and that sort of thing, and then I will uh, take the mic back at that point. Mike Everling, one of the three, pardon me, one of the four founders of the Carl Hess Club. As a matter of fact, let's, let's get this out of the way. Would the other two founders of the Carl Hess Club, Brad Lineweaver and Kent Hastings, stand up, please? These are the um, three, uh, three uh, founders. And now the man who usually, who, who usually uh, starts things off at these meetings, Mike Everling. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Now at this point I usually turn everything over to Brad, and this is, normally this is, this is his job. Uh, but uh, I, I will just say a few prefatory things. This was uh, definitely a brainchild of Sam's. Uh, we had conversations when I would give him rides places, and. One of them was his observation that the Valley was bereft of any kind of a supper club experience like the Mencken or the Knock Forums, and we were playing with the idea of starting a supper club like that that would be specifically for the Valley. And then it was very shortly after we announced the formation of this club that the Mencken and the Knock Forums ceased to be. So the mantle fell upon us to, to take up this uh, supper club cudgel. So that's what we've done. We've tried to do for the last, well, almost 10 years. Sadly, uh, Sam will not be uh, at the, the 10th anniversary meeting, except in spirit. But uh, what remains of him uh, will certainly be among us. I mean, his ideas and his sensibilities, we'll try to, uh, to honor that. I may um, have some announcements later. I want to see if we do have some fairly brief announcements uh, from the floor and then perhaps uh, I will ask Brad to make a special announcement on behalf of the club and I may make some remarks later. So, uh, would anybody like to start off uh, with uh, a special announcement uh, apropos? Uh, this is a normal part of our, of our Carl Hess Club meeting so it can be apropos of nothing or everything. Victor Komen. Well, to keep in uh, uh, line with uh, Sam's uh, uh, commercialism, no matter how inappropriate the venue, um, <laughs> I'm announcing the uh, creation of uh, Triplanetary Traders, which will try to keep uh, Sam's uh, uh, essence alive by making all of the back issues of New Libertarian available either in original issues, of which I have in some cases too many, and, uh, uh, or, or quality photocopies. Uh, so uh, you've all gotten a uh, copy of this. If you didn't, see me afterwards and I'll give you one. And it uses uh, PayPal payment technology, so you can use your credit card or your own PayPal account. 
And uh, since we just got it up and running and we haven't tested it yet, because apparently you can't test it from your, the e-commerce the, the e person can't test it from his own uh, email address. Uh, if anybody wants to go out there and buy something uh, today, I'd be really happy to get your feedback and find out whether it works or not. And uh, um, that's it. I'd like to uh, thank Neil for uh, setting this up, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for having come, because uh, uh, Sam certainly was very deserving of it. So thanks a lot. A lot of you in this room clearly have known him a lot longer than that. I returned to Las Vegas after four and a half years living back in Boston, and I, I think it was the first time I met Sam, or maybe the second time. Um, I had chaired uh, three of the only, of only seven conventions that we've had in Las Vegas for for science fiction in the 90s, and one of the first things Sam said to me was, "So when is the next con?" Well, he helped me answer that question. It's in October of this year. And we have flyers that were done by Sam himself. This is possibly uh, maybe one of the last projects he's, he's worked on for uh, science fiction fandom. Anybody who's interested, I have flyers to give out. And all the information you need if you're interested in attending the convention is here. And if nothing else, you can have a Sam flyer. Thank you. Edward Bowers from uh, the Libertarian Party. Well, I'm not here as a. Uh, member of the Libertarian Party, but as a longtime uh, 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 attendee of the Carl Hess Club and also a neighbor of Sam's because I was, uh, I've had a mailbox at 291 South La Cienega Boulevard, uh, thanks to uh, courtesy of David Silvers uh, for about the same amount of time that Sam did. And I know that if Sam were here, he would want to make his own announcement, because he had been making this announcement the last few months, that uh, there is going to be the Freedom Fest in Las Vegas, another Las Vegas event. That's in May. It's the weekend of the, uh, I want to say, the 13th, 14th, 15th, something like that. And I'll be going to that. Uh, and actually, I'm, I haven't figured out how I'm going to get there. I'm going to actually continue on and make a road trip from Vegas to Atlanta, which will be a, a party event, which Sam wouldn't normally touch with a 10-foot pole. Although I saw him, I saw him at one once, but uh, that's another story. Um, and uh, anyway, and uh, we're going to try to have some fun with that. I'm actually going to bring my camera with me and try to do a documentary, which may or may not be called It's Right Here, Man in response to uh, Mr. Moore's Dude, Where's My Country? So uh, anyway, um, for, but anyway, the, the beginning of my road trip will be something, an event which everyone can attend. It's uh, Mark Skousen uh, promotes it. And it's, uh, once again, it's Freedom Fest. It's in May, I want to say 13, 14, 15, 16, that weekend. So if Sam were here, he would want to remind you of that. And so check it out. Go to their website, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, just before we continue, I, I would just like to say that as one of Sam's erstwhile patrons, David, you, you certainly deserve a hand, too. David Silvers, give him a hand. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, well, you know, I, I've got a story I could tell about almost everybody in the room here, you know, is from my... But certainly somebody that, that I'll tell you a very... just getting a little bit personal here. Uh, I, I do want to, uh, Neil just reminded me, we should uh, point out someone who was special to Sam and also to myself too. He was, he was, a, he was a savior to me as well, I, m I might say. Uh, Michael Shaw, would you stand up and just, uh, just, just stand up and, and let, take, take a little applause. My, Michael uh, was an employer or a, a contract supplier for me and Sam at one time. In fact, we worked together in Michael's uh, office in the We Clean America Maid Service. Are we going to have a chance to, you know, share? Absolutely, yeah. I don't want to steal your thunder, but, I, you know, Neil suggested that, you know, you deserve to be singled out because of that special time in our lives that we spent there. As a matter of fact, let me just, you know, start right at this moment. Anybody who ever lent Sam any money, a round of applause. Uh, 
Um, we have a lot of honored guests here today uh, who, are going to be, um, who are going to be speaking, but I would like to start out by making the, uh, the first toast to Sam, so I'm going to grab my dark beer. Everybody fill your glasses. Friends, libertarians, fans, lend me your elfin ears. I come not to bury Konkin, but praise him. I will rip off Shakespeare knowing that Sam did not believe in copyright. <laughs> Sam was wrong about copyright, of course, but I will not argue that point here. <laughs> since I come not to bury Konkin, but praise him. Who among us was not driven to the point of madness by Konkin? He would sit in a coffee shop, letting his coffee get cold on the table set before him because the waitress had forgotten to bring his orange juice. For as Sam, the theoretical chemist, explained the breakfast rules, first comes the cold acid, then the hot acid. <laughs> but Sam was my friend, faithful and just to me. No matter where Sam was going, he was always late. And now he is really, really late. Though it is uncertain that women are from Venus, Sam was probably from Mars, because the length of a Martian day is 24 hours and 39 minutes, and 24 hours weren't enough for Sam. He'd stay awake for 16 hours, then sleep for 10, which adds up to a 26-hour day. You'd never know when he was going to be waking up and when he'd be asleep, which is really, really fun when you're trying to run a book publishing company with Sam doing the book production. But why do I complain about this to you? I come not to bury Konkin, but praise him. He would sit in the front seat of my car, but refused to fasten his seatbelt because he was more worried about being trapped in a car that was sinking into water than being thrown out of a car that crashed. And guess what, Sam? We were both wrong. Neither one killed you. <laughs> he bought me meals when I was broke, and I bought him meals when he was broke. He got me to write at my lowest pay rates, and I got him to typeset books at his. We crisscrossed the continent together, and I am one of the three living people, uh, one other is in the room with me today, who can say that they survived being in a car he was driving. <laughs> yeah, the other one is sitting right there, Bob Cohen. <laughs> and while he saw that I'd lost faith in his theory of counter-economics, let me pay Sam this tribute to his theory. Sam lived three decades in the United States without ever getting a green card. You got away with it, Sam. You said you'd die before the state ever got its hands on you, and it never did. <laughs> My heart is in the coffin there with Konkin, and I must pause till it come back to me. And enough of that. I am lacrimose intolerant. <laughs> Laissez-faire, Sam, and don't forget to smash the state. Hey, this beer is good. That's not bad at all. <laughs> to, um, to begin our, uh, our speakers tonight, I'm going to invite up Vanessa Komen, who is uh, uh, Sam's goddaughter. Vanessa Komen. Um, that was lovely, Neil, by the way. Um, sorry, I have to follow that. Uh, I, I just have... I told you it was going to speak. I just wanted to. Okay, I just wanted to share a short little story that I had. Um, he was my godfather, and well, still is. Um, I he lived kind of farther away from me, so I didn't really like I'd seen him every now and then growing up, but I didn't know him really well. Like I never had long conversations with him or anything like that. I didn't know him as well as my dad Victor did, but. The last Carl Hess Club that I attended, I got into this long conversation with Neil and Sam about New York. And I had no idea that Sam had lived there. And I had just visited it for the first time this past summer. And, you know, I just brought it up in passing. And we got in this long conversation about how great New York was and how much fun we had, you know, there. And we were talking about Nathan's hot dogs and all these silly little things. And I just, it meant a lot to me that I had that moment to talk with him and connect with him. And 
I found out later that, that was the last time I would see him, and I just want to share that with you. That yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go in any particular uh, order of ranking tonight, but we do have a sitting U.S. Congressman here tonight, and I figure that he outranks the rest of us on the basis of that. Well, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. What kind of meeting is this? <laughs> Look, let me rephrase that. Let me introduce the man who converted Sam Konkin to libertarianism, Dana Rohrabacher. Oh, yes, I, uh, I think it's the, the better explanation. I probably met Sam before anyone in this room. Did anyone in this room meet Sam before I did? Back in 1967, 68? Well, his, his brother is here. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> there he goes. I didn't. All right, so I met Sam in uh, Wisconsin. And when we were trying to put together this uh, libertarian uh, cabal against the conservatives who ran the Young Americans for Freedom, and Sam, of course, was part of, was of the conspiracy from Wisconsin. And uh, I can remember the very first time I met Sam, he was wearing, totally wearing black. And today I am wearing, totally wearing black, including my underwear, in honor of Sam. <laughs> and uh, Sam was, uh, I mean, right off the bat, I mean, I could tell this man was a visionary. He was, uh, he understood science and he understood liberty. And it was, it was incredible. And Sam was uh, very dear to my heart all these years. And uh, uh, I met many, many people over the years, but I always knew that Sam Conkin was my friend and a good human being who I'd like to spend a time with. But, you know, as our paths diverge, that's what happens as you get older. Uh, let me just note that when I was first elected to Congress, I was a very vulnerable person because I'd had such a wild lifestyle earlier on. And uh, uh, now that I've been in Congress 16 years, it doesn't matter now. But, uh, uh, but I do remember that uh, one point, uh, one of my uh, former libertarian friends uh, got angry with me at some vote that I had made. You know, it wasn't pure. And of course, whenever you're in po real politics, it's not pure at all. You're, you know, you're hiking into that puddle of uh, of whatever it is, and you hope it doesn't go over your head. But uh, anyway, that, that this person uh, disclosed that I had used drugs when I was younger, and he had witnessed it. And uh, well, all I can say is that it, it, it was a one-day story, because I said, yes, that happened, and, and it was uh, uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, and I haven't done anything for so many years, and blah, 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 that's that. Well. You know, I, but nobody likes to have their parents know all about their foibles and everything like that. And so I, I remember that I walked onto the floor of the house and there was a fellow that was elected the same year I was uh, named Mel Hancock. And I don't know if he was one of the true, uh, uh, you would say, you, I think you'd say libertarians because he was always fighting to bring down the size of government. And uh, he had, was elected when he was 62 years old. And it was now a couple of years or a year or so after that. And he saw that I was looking kind of grim and he came up to me and he put his arm around me and he said, Dana, don't let it get you down. The great thing about being elected to Congress after you're 60 years old is that all your college roommates are dead. <laughs> now, now, let me just say that we started out this whole libertarian struggle so many years ago, and uh, Sam Conkin was there right at the beginning. And he was someone that I knew not only agreed with me, and not only did we commiserate and did we plan these great strategies of how we would change the world, et cetera, but we were friends. And, we always, and I knew always that Sam had a very good heart. And uh, over the years when I saw him, I, I had great conversations with him, and he was a fine, fine person who was deeply embedded in my heart, as are Neil and, and a lot of the other fellows, Chris Schaefer and others, who were part of this anarcho village. And, and if I remember correctly, I think I found that apartment complex that later became the anarcho village. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. Yes, you did. And, and now... <laughs> And now I want you to know 
that I represent that area in the United States Congress, but I don't get any votes out of Anarcho Village. So, uh, but let me just say that uh, it really is fitting that a man like myself who knows absolutely nothing about science as compared to Sam Kunkin, who is a genius, uh, is now, I am chairman of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee. And, uh, so, and Sam, the visionary, didn't get power, but that's the way it works in government, right? And um, the bottom line is, Sam stayed true to his principles. I didn't, uh, I was not a hundred percenter, obviously. No one is a hundred percenter who goes into government, but I try to do my very best to remember those days and remember those principles and come as close as to them as I can and still survive. Uh, Sam Gunkin lived his principles, and uh, I know all of you probably spent more time over the years with Sam than I did because it's been a long time since those days back in 1969 when we made our way to the arch in St. Louis and the libertarians split from the conservatives, and um, it's been a long time since then, but uh, I just would like to toast to my good friend, man who started out this, uh, this quest for freedom and justice and liberty together with me. And I'll always remember him, and I hope you do too. God bless him. Here's to Sam. Huzzah. By the way, when early on, I'll never forget, Sam was involved in some of these things, and we were involved with the freedom conferences at USC and everything like that. It was, we had some terrific memories. And just remember, as we're trying to build a better world, uh, my motto, I have it on my, uh, you know, over my door. And, and in Washington, it says fighting for freedom and having fun. We had some wonderful times together, wonderful memories, and I'm very, very pleased that my life touched Sam's and Sam's life touched me. Thank you very much. Dana Rohrabacher, Subcommittee on Space and Technology. Victor Komen, author of Kings of the High Frontier. You two need to talk. <laughs> uh, next, I'm going to... Uh, invite up the man here who really does know Sam earlier than the rest of us, Sam's brother, Alan Konkin. Well, thanks a lot, Neil. I just want to say to everyone here how very pre pleased and privileged I feel today to be able to speak to you. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to also introduce my oldest son, Richard. Um, this was, uh, is Sam's oldest nephew, and he's uh, obviously here attending and wanted a chance to hear some of the uh, attributes and stories that we would today. I also want to th take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for being a friend and a companion, an acquaintance, but most of all for being a supporter of my brother. The lifestyle he chose to live could not have been accomplished without the support of everybody in this room. And over the last few weeks, Neil Schulman has shared with me the history of Sam that helped me understand some of the decisions he made along the way. On one of my visits to California to visit my brother, I'd come to the conclusion that he was living the style of life he did because he had chosen to do so. In my mind, I respected the fact that he was freeborn of mature age and had the freedom to make that choice. After I came to that conclusion, our relationship improved, and we did start to communicate on a more regular basis. We, um, <clears throat> we spoke on special occasions, birthdays, Christmas, Boxing Day, of course Thanksgiving, and it provided me an opportunity through the technology of email and certainly telephones that I could keep him up to date on our family what was, uh, my mother was doing, what my, his two nephews, Richard and David, were up to, and his niece, Heather. For those of you who are aware, Sam was born July 8, 1947, which made him a sign of a cancer, in a small town called Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, in Canada. Prince Albert is known to be a very agricultural and farming community in northern Saskatchewan. Our grandparents, whose names were Ignat and Anne Abrasimov, and Sam and Polly Konkin were of Russian origin, and our great-grandparents were born in Russia. The story unfolds that our great-grandparents left Russia because they were persecuted for their religious beliefs, which included not believing in violence and war, and were so passive and determined, that, or stubborn, 
that they would not bear arms. One of our uncles, our Uncle Mike, was so true to this philosophy that he spent some time in jail because he refused to bear arms when he was conscripted into the Canadian military during World War II. In 1949, our parents, Sam and Helen, left Saskatchewan and relocated to Edmonton. At that time, they bought a small grocery store. Uh, my, dad uh, my dad and mother worked in that store uh, and later became a salesperson uh, in the city of Edmonton. Sam grew up in Edmonton, went to school there, went to university there, and at the age of 21 left Edmonton to the United States to start his chosen life. We don't have a lot of relatives in Edmonton left. Our dad passed away 10 years ago, and that's the, <clears throat> and that's the last time um, that I um, ooh, had a chance to see Sam. Our mother still lives in, in a senior's home, uh, my wife, Carol Ann, our three children, Richard, David, and Heather, and we have five cousins who also live there. We also have an Uncle Harry who still lives in Sask Saskatchewan, in Saskatoon, and he's the oldest of my, uh, my dad's family who's still alive. The Konkan DNA does contain a seed of intelligence. <clears throat> All of the children of our parents' generation are university educated. One cousin has a PhD in some kind of unbelievable physics. Another is a medical doctor practicing in the province of British Columbia, and the rest of us all have undergraduate degrees in different disciplines. Education was obviously made a priority in our family. We later learned that our parents were very, very smart in school also, but they grew up so poor that they could not afford an education for themselves. Over the last few weeks, after talking with Neil and some of, uh, some of you, my memories of our childhood and growing up started to come back. Sam was four years older than I was, but as opposite as could be. He was not athletic. He loved to read. He started reading somewhere between the ages of three and four. He loved comic books. He excelled at school. He loved science fiction and enjoying being active in politics. I'm the absolute opposite and probably all of those. As a family, our dad was the major breadwinner, had two careers, one of being a salesman, and his second career of being a campground supervisor at one of Canada's national parks. My mom worked part-time in the retail business to assist the family cash flow, and we were able to take yearly holidays, owned our own home, had a car, and lived in a fairly well-to-do area. First jobs. As uh, Sam grew up, we quickly learned that we did not have a lot of money so at a very young age, he, just, he decided he wanted to have more so he could do a few things. So when he was about 10 years old, he secured his first job of selling magazines door to door. Later a flyer route and also a Star Weekly paper route. It's probably pretty normal stuff, but to explain this a little further, Sam was so determined or stubborn that he would not return home until he had sold out all of those magazines. And you also need to know that selling magazines door-to-door -door in Canada is not a great experience. <laughs> because the temperature during those years would get down to minus 30 degrees below zero centigrade. So talk about stubborn or desire. Once he got older, his education assisted him in landing jobs in chemistry. He, in fact, had jobs with the uh, uh, provincial government, I think it was, at, the ex at an experimental farm in uh, northern Alberta. And later on, he worked, at, uh, he worked in Ottawa at the nation's capital. I'm sure you all also know that Sam hated the cold and snow of Canada. <laughs> and I'm sure that's one reason why he loved California. I was saddened last week, mm, these are tough, when we buried Sam and it was minus 10 and we still have snow on the ground. <clears throat> Being four years older, we went to different schools. However, I have some memories there too. <clears throat> he was a genius in school. He was always, he always scored. Oh. He always scored in the uh, top 3% of his class. He started to read around four years old. He skipped grade three in his very intelligent, <clears throat> sorry, he skipped grade three. And this is a very significant year because this was the year that you normally learn to write. <laughs> 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 
And as many of you know, Sam should have been probably a medical doctor because his penmanship was so, so poor. <laughs> because he was advanced a grade, he also was the smallest kid in the class and was picked on constantly. <clears throat> it didn't help to be smart either because he was then bullied and his defense was to help the biggest kid in the class with his homework and therefore had a protector. <laughs> he also, at that time, in, in, in those eras, he uh, wore his thick black framed plastic glasses. He also had pens in the shirt of his pocket with the holder. And his favorite pen happened to be a fountain or cartridge pen that he used to keep his notes with. And as we all know, that those type of people are now have been labeled as nerds. Well, he was one for sure. In Canada, junior high school ends at grade nine, and in the 60s, grade nine students had to write final departmental exams before they advanced to high school. These ex exams were 100% of your mark for that whole year. Anything you did during the year didn't mean anything. Sam scored the highest marks in the school, um, in the school in all the major core subjects. His name is still recorded on a, on a plaque in that school. <clears throat> In high school, uh, Sam continued to excel at school. Upon graduating high school, he was successful in gaining a scholarship, went to the University of Alberta and completed his honors BSc at the age of 21. He then gained a scholarship and I think a TA, a TA position um, in Wisconsin and that's when he left home and, and then ended up also in New York and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more of the history later this afternoon. During Sam's university days in Edmonton, he got involved with model parliament political activities. He had a small group of friends that uh, had these similar kinds of interests. Sam also used to love to play war games called Risk, as one of them I remember, with his friends. However, when I used to watch them play, they behaved like they were really at war. <laughs> and when I used to watch them play, um, they, it, they take hours to shake the dice because they had to speak about the move for, the, for half an hour before they shook it. <laughs> So uh, naturally, my, uh, my level of uh, attention disappeared quickly. When Sam was in his first or second year of university, he lost a very close friend. This friend was named Peter Basak, and he lost him because this young man played Russian roulette with a real gun and lost. I think this suicide affected my brother. Um, but I was, probably too, I was probably too young to understand. Over the last few weeks, I was reminded of some of Sam's quirks. And I know that many of you could add to this list and probably will today, but let me tell you a few that I remember. One, Sam liked to have burnt toast, toast, toast in the morning. Had to be burnt black and that's the way he used to like it. He was uh, very fond of Canadian bacon. And the main reason uh, was that regular bacon was far too fatty for him. He, he didn't like the fat on, on meat. Uh, Sam always took his glasses off and put them in his pocket before he would eat his meal so he didn't splash any of the food on them. He always ate each item separately on his plate or each item separately because he didn't like to mix the items. He loved to smoke his pipe. I think his first pipe was curved like the one that Sherlock Holmes smoked. And he also made sure he smoked a very special blend of tobacco uh, which became his own personal blend. He uh, never had a car operator's license. He did have a motor scooter operating license, and at 14, he in fact had a motor scooter that he drove to school. I inherited it later. He hated fat on beef and would work hard in removing all the fat before he would eat that meal. He loved pizza. He loved real, real mashed potatoes and gravy. He took the public transport bus everywhere he went. He went through different phases in his life that I remember, things like dinosaurs. And not just like collecting them or anything like that. He actually would know so much about them that he would go to movies and be able to communicate how poor they were done because the dinosaurs lived millions of years apart in, in that kind of thing. He went through a civil war phase, and I think that's where he started learning about the U.S. And uh, very detailed on that, and loved to play board games. He stopped going to Sunday school at a very young age, and in, instead, though, to compromise that, <clears throat> he would read a chapter of the Bible every Sunday. He's the, only, he's the only person I know who read the Bible from start to finish when he was about 12 years old. 
I also remember one year he played horse races for an entire year. He would handicap them, he would make a $2 bet on each race, he would keep track of it, but he never went to the races. And at the end of the year, he, oh, he followed them each day in the newspaper, who won and who lost, and at the end of the year, he wanted to determine, did he make any money or not? I think he made a small amount, but just to show you again his tenacity to keep up that kind of project for a year. Um, when we were growing up, you could go to a Saturday matinee and stay in the theater and watch the movie two or three times the same day. He did that quite frequently. He um, always had a book. He was reading wherever he went, probably mostly on the bus because that's where he spent lots of his time. Um, he loved TV. He had learned that color TV was coming to Canada, so he saved his money. He bought a color TV for our house when he first came out and so he could watch different TV shows on Sunday night. One I remember was Bonanza that we were, he could watch in living color. If I, didn't, if I didn't fight with him too much, then he would let me watch his color TV with him. <laughs> Sam also loved to sing in the bath. He didn't like the shower, but he was very young. He joined a record club, and his favorite records at that time were the sound of tracks from Broadway musicals. The one in particular I remember he always sang was My Fair Lady. Very, very important for our mother. Uh, she never really understood why Sam would not come home to visit her. <clears throat> At least she was able to see her son for the last time. In conclusion, I'd like to ensure you <clears throat> that Sam did have a family in Canada uh, that loved him, missed him, but I have to admit, we didn't understand many of his decisions. What I have come to learn is that all of you here have really been Sam's family. <clears throat> and I'm so pleased for him that he had you as brothers and sisters. To Neil, I want him to know that he was probably more of a brother to Sam than I was. And I want to thank Neil for being Sam's other younger brother. Thanks. Alan, thank you so much, uh, both for both your comments in general, but also for what you just said about me. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hearing people that they need a, a slight bathroom break. So uh, let's, let's call a five minute recess in the uh, proceedings and then we'll, uh, we'll continue. Okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna switch the order of play. Uh, first, I'm gonna introduce David Silvers of Beverly Hills Publishing, who was um, um, the, uh, the, the last man to give uh, uh, employment to Sam, David Silvers. Not only was I the last one to give employment to him, I was the last one to see Sam alive uh, in this room. I said, uh, not only was I the last one to give employment to him, but I was the last one to see him alive in this room. And uh, he, uh, Sam, somewhere between Janis Joplin and Sam Conklin, the words echoing my, my head, Freedom, freedom, freedom. Sam, you had to accept f Sam the way he was and the way he wasn't. And uh, all the ideas and the people that he had around him were just uh, a pleasure because he was always a challenge. You couldn't do anything that would please him and you'd do everything that would please him. I'm an I'm a, a election inspector for 10 years in Beverly Hills and he says, you know, I'm completely out of step, you know. <laughs> My sister, who was Assistant Secretary of Education under Lamar Alexander, that's when the older Bush was president, uh, said I introduced her to him because she wrote for the Plato Society. And he's, ah, he says, you do something like that, you dishonor yourself. I, I was so embarrassed in front of my sister. She was visiting from New York. You couldn't please Sam no matter what. <laughs> I mean, you were out of step politically. He would always keep you on your toes with something else. 
So it, it wasn't your family because, Alan, he talked about the, your family all the time. I sit there and listen to him. He loved you very much. And, you know, Christmas I sent him up to see Kent because Kent was so important to him and Neil was important to him because you guys have something to offer. And I hope that I stay in touch with all of you because uh, it, uh, the spirit of Sam will stay be alive will still stay alive. And another thing about Sam, his writing was deplorable, but his fingers would fly on that computer faster than you could speak words. There was something magical about Sam. And uh, believe me, I don't feel like I'm losing him. I feel like I'm being inspired to do even greater things. In incidentally, a uh, 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 crass commercial plug here. If anybody does need publishing services for a book, David Silvers is the man to see right now. Thank you. Um, so let me go back to our previous order of play here. Uh, the next speaker is going to be two speakers uh, who are collaborators on the new alternate history novel, Anarchia. First, Brad Lineweaver, then J. Kent Hastings, Brad Lineweaver. I was going to wait. I was going to wait a little while longer so we'd have a little more attrition rate, so it'd feel like a normal Carl Hess club. I figured, <laughs> would about ten or fifteen of you please leave? <laughs> um, actually, actually, I would like to point out that my favorite moment with Samuel Edward Conkin the third at any of these supper clubs was some years ago. In fact, I think it was back in 1995, the Agorist Quarterly. He never did do the full book on agorism, but he did the Agorist Quarterly, and Kent Hastings is, uh, wait, what's causing that? Uh, Kent Hastings is, was assistant director. Uh, I was the review editor. Uh, Jared Lobdell was the only person with a PhD working on this who couldn't be here today. Uh, we made the thing look like an academic journal, and what I remember is there was a fairly large turnout, you know, maybe, uh, maybe uh, 30 people and I held it up and I said, you know, this is an amazing achievement by Samuel Edward Conkin III. You'd almost think there was an Agorist Institute. <laughs> Everybody laughed but Sam. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, I always wanted to do a video where you have this lovely building, the Agorist Institute, and it slowly moves in. As the camera comes in, you expect it's going to go to an office, but it doesn't. It just keeps going in and going in, and things are getting smaller and smaller until you get to that little P.O. box. <laughs> now, Victor was talking about the fact, I'm sorry Richard Kyle couldn't be here today, but Dana uh, Robacher was in fact talking about the Long Beach days, and we do have Chris Schaefer here. Chris, stand up, stand up, Chris, and just take a bow. This guy was the center of the Anarcho Villa. Thank you, Chris. I think the ultimate uh, achievement of that era is the Heinlein New Libertarian that came out in December 1990. Chris did a piece on Destination Moon. Uh, years later, with access to the Heinlein archives, through uh, Jenny Heinlein, I did a piece on Destination Moon, and one of the few articles on the movie I quoted was Chris Schaefer in New Libertarian. We had a piece by Heinlein himself after he was gone, Virginia, Robert Anton Wilson, Bob Shea, J. Neil Shulman, Victor Komen, L. Neil Smith, myself. This was a quite remarkable achievement, and at that time, Richard Kyle was doing Argosy Magazine uh, with some beautiful Jim Steranko covers, and he made New Libertarian look completely professional completely commercial. It had a full page ad in the New York Review of Science Fiction. It was taken seriously by Locus, a science fiction chronicle. It sold, it made money for Sam, and he knew something had to be done, so this was the last issue of New Libertarian. <laughs> one, of, one of the things I like best, but I could talk about Sam all night. Uh, at one time, Kent Hastings had this car that we called the Honda Zwilnik. It was this lime green, disgusting thing that looked like it had come out of Godzilla's nostril, you know. <laughs> and we were getting on the 405 headed for Long Beach, and a cop pulled us over. I was driving. Sam was in the uh, passenger seat. I don't remember why the cop pulled us over, but for some bizarre reason, he wanted documentation on this remarkable vehicle. Well. <laughs> 
Sam couldn't open the glove compartment. It was jammed so full. He had those boots, you know, and he's trying to get the glove compartment open. And somehow he mentioned, well, you know, this is, you know, it, it wouldn't be uh, either my driver or me. This is the company car. <laughs> and I remember the expression on that cop when he heard company car. And Sam was trying to get the thing open. He said, uh, go on. And so we went to Richard Kyle in Long Beach, and Sam walked in, and he says, we just saw a demonstration of the power of the Agorist Institute and counter-economics. Why, even a policeman was, you know, saying to traffic, let this car through. This is the company car of the Agorist Institute. Uh, I don't know what planet Sam lived on, but I, I, I enjoyed visiting there occasionally. Um, Earlier, my friend Kent played a radio recording that he has a recording of of Ronald Reagan talking about an article I did when I was a young American for Freedom 2. Sam was a yaffer, Dana was a yaffer, I was a yaffer, and I had a piece in a national magazine that Reagan liked, and it ended up in a book called Stories in His Own Hand, The Everyday Wisdom of Ronald Reagan. And we thought it had been a letter that Reagan had written to somebody. We found out later, through many efforts on Neil Shulman's part, uh, this book was discovered by Victor Komen. I believe you discovered, Neil discovered the radio broadcast. Uh, Ray Bradbury helped out a little during that period, too, because he was fascinated. His late wife, Maggie, was friends with people who run the Reagan Library. But we found this article where Reagan's talking at some length about this article I did as the affer. Then later we found the broadcast. I remember the night I showed the article to Sam. You were there, your mother were there, it was a Chinese restaurant. And you'll back me up that I'm not making this up. Only Samuel Edward Conkin III could possibly do this. He read what Reagan had to say about my article, which was very positive. He says, a young man named Brad Lineweaver. And at the end of the article, I was arguing for capitalism against this socialist co-ed who I did not succeed in picking up. And, um, <laughs> And at the, uh, at the end of the article, Re Re Reagan says, how right he is. And, 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 and Sam sat there and read through it. He says, you know, this association makes Reagan look better. <laughs> I, I think it may have something to do with the fact that, um, that Reagan never did any work directly for the counter economy or as Sam called it, the movement, or as Sam also called it, his own private operation. Somehow, Konkin thought he brought down the Soviet Union, Reagan thought he did. I always wanted a debate. <laughs> now, one of the great things to, to move along here, because when I'm introducing Kent, Kent and I did a novel about the Spanish Civil War, which was uh, finished last year. Uh, it was delayed by the publisher, but it's supposed to come out another month or so. We talk about agorism in the novel. We talk about Samuel Edward Conkin III. Uh, Sam uh, looked at it. He was always copy editing and proofreading stuff and always looking at uh, the Publis.com days with Neil. He was always looking at our various projects. But it was not the first time that, that Samuel Edward Conkin III ended up in science fiction works, this, this book that Kent and I did called Anarchia. Actually, in a book, Michael Moorcock was one of his favorite writers. When He introduced me to Michael Moorcock, and he did an autograph with a little black flag of anarchy. And I was invited to do a story call, uh, for a book called Pawn of Chaos. I did a story about Jerry Cornelius. Some of you may remember the Jerry Cornelius character. Uh, he doesn't just do the albino warrior Elric. Jerry Cornelius is a science fiction character. But at one point, I have this city at the exact center of the universe. So naturally, it thinks it's New York City. I mean, it's, it's the center of the space-time continuum floating in outer space in a force field. And naturally, it has to be New York City if it's the literal center of the universe. And all these people have been reincarnated there. And the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, is on a motorcycle. And she's zooming around on her motorcycle. She's in her, I think she's in her 20s. And um, she's talking about somebody who she heard on radio who clearly was inspired by Konkin. So I'm just going to read about two paragraphs here. I don't remember who it was. It was on Earth somewhere. I'm sure about that. Anyway, this guy got this show so he could denounce religion. But the funny thing was that he really knew his subject. He complained about liberal men of the cloth watering down the message so as to make it more palatable. He read the Bible and consulted with scholars and became like a Chesterton for orthodoxy. But he never denied he was an atheist. He thought that by describing the real thing, he would bring more viewers to their senses. Before he knew it, he was receiving donations from religious conservatives. 
They loved him on doctrinal purity so much that they didn't care he was an atheist. <laughs> so what's the point of this story, she asked over the sound of the, uh, uh, of the motorcycle. Uh, did he convert? This is uh, the main character talking to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, did he convert? No, he just got rich. <laughs> so what is it you miss about living on Earth? Irony. She chuckled. There's plenty of irony here. Then it goes on a little while. Yes, she admitted. You know, let me see. Uh, let's see, you've only recently noticed that. Uh, uh, okay. Um, if you know where to look for it, what's the point of being a monarch in a practical anarchy? You've only recently noticed that, he said, smiling in spite of himself and holding on more tightly to her youthful figure. Yes, she admitted, but I'm dealing with it more effectively since reading the New Libertarian Manifesto by Samuel Edward Conkin III. He applies the free enterprise model to situations you'd never imagine. So I'm going to market the royalty idea the same as any other product. I'll bet you I sell a lot of subscriptions to my newsletter. <laughs> All right. I'm almost done here, but I just wanted to stress the fact that Konkin uh, was, was such a work of art himself that anybody who was in the business of creating fiction uh, just had to pay close attention to Sec 3 and wouldn't have to uh, do that much imaginative work. Uh, in June or July, a book is coming out from Bain Books called Visions of Liberty. And uh, I have a story in it called A Reception at the Anarchist Embassy. And uh, the character is named Konsky. And he looks like a cross between Samuel Edward Conkin III and Groucho Marx. The reason I did Groucho Marx is people said there was a Marxist style to how Sam wrote and defended capitalism. <laughs> and I remember that fire sign theater thing, all hail Marx and Lenin, and it's Groucho Marx and John Lennon. Well, John Lennon's half a Marxist. Anyway, what I have in this scene is I just want to give you this scene. See, the two twins are fighting it out over robots. One con can wants to free the robots. And the other Konkin says, get your hands off my property. And they both use quotes from the New Libertarian Manifesto, even though they're on opposite sides of the robot freedom issue. So just this, suddenly there came the dread cry of laissez-faire. The terrifying words rose up from the general noise of the crowd. The air was filled with electric tension. Then the same mysterious voice shouted, end robot slavery now. Oh no muttered Palmer. What is it, asked Bretney. Not what, who. There are two Konskis here. So anyway, this will be out in June or July from Bain Books. And basically, the story is Sam arguing with Sam, pretty much. <laughs> and, and now to conclude, before I, I turn this over to Kent, uh, because what I really wanted to do here was point out the influence of, of Konkin is lasting not only by what he did, but by the impact he had on others. I did a story based on Sam's dietary habits. <laughs> for, half a year, for half a year, I lived with Kent and Sam in an apartment in Culver City, and right across from us was Neil Shulman. And I got to witness how Sam cooked, how he ate, how he prepared food. And, and, and you know, he'd give me the heart stopper omelets till I found out what they were made of. You know, and then I stopped eating those. <laughs> I was willing to eat some other things. But basically, I couldn't get over it. So I imagine what would happen if a woman married a mad Canadian chef. I set the story in Atlanta, Georgia. I named the guy Edmund, because I was looking at a map of Canada and saw Edmonton. So, you know, Edmund, rather than Sec 3. But it's obviously Sam. And I'm just going to read you the climax of the story, where the wife has been married to the mad Canadian chef. and. Every line of dialogue I attribute to Edmund in this story from beginning to end, I did not make up. I kept the notebook. I just wrote down everything he said about food. <laughs> so when I sent this thing to Marty Greenberg, Marty Greenberg said, you know, Brad, there's just this one thing. This character you totally made up. He's great. But these characters you like took from real life, like the woman. There's a little problem with her motivation. And, I, and, and he said, but I wouldn't have you touch that character who just came out of your own imagination. I just want to know, how do you do it? Where do you come up with it? I said, well, oh, Marty, you either, you either got it or you don't, man. <laughs> and so, with that in mind, one Sunday morning I decided to risk, this is the wife talking, 
One Sunday morning, I decided to risk eating a whole breakfast with him. Having skipped dinner the night before, the sun was shining, the birds were singing, a cool breeze was wafting through the open window. Nothing could spoil this day except, what are you doing, came the terrible question. What? You're putting jelly on your toast. Yes, Edmund, I am. But you're not supposed to do that until after you finish the eggs. Jelly is for dessert. <laughs> This was a new one on me. I felt very unladylike as I told him in no uncertain terms, go to hell, dear. <laughs> he, he stared at me without blinking. Then he got up and brought me pancakes. I was going to pass on trying his heart stoppers pancakes because we've already done the heart stopper omelets. But I was so angry that I was ready to eat anything. I grabbed the bottle of pure maple syrup, broke the hymen, which was a phrase of his, break, break the hymen on a bottle. Broke the hymen, so she's picking up his phrases even as she's... <laughs> broke the hymen, positioned the neck of the bottle over the plate, and what are you doing? Uh, putting syrup on the pancakes? You haven't eaten your eggs yet. You have to finish the eggs first before Edmund. <laughs> are you feeling all right? What are you doing now? You can't drink coffee until after you've Edmund. You'll give yourself an ulcer if you drink coffee at the wrong part of a meal. Surely you must know that, Edmund. The only ulcer I have to worry about is the one you're giving me. <laughs> he stopped, or mainly, he, or maybe, maybe he was just resting. We, we stared at each other, and then I got up and left. The coffee was still in my hand. My supply of sympathy was running low. That evening, I tried to make peace. I thought it might help if I volunteered to prepare dinner. We had all the ingredients for a fine salad, tomatoes, lettuce, radishes, green onions, fresh mushrooms, avocado, cucumber, carrots, and a wonderful Italian dressing. After finding a long knife with serrated edges, I began slicing the tomato real fine. Suddenly the voice I was coming to dread asked, what are you doing? <laughs> what could it be this time? I wasn't eating anything. <laughs> I wasn't drinking anything. I hadn't combined anything with anything. I'm slicing the tomato, I told my husband. But that's a steak knife, he said. You can't use that for a tomato. <laughs> with all the powers of self-control left in me, I kept my voice even and said, this was the only knife I could find with, you know, with sharp, it was sharp edges. Here, he literally screamed, yanking open a drawer and pulling out a short blade knife with a smooth edge. This is for cutting. It's too short, I said very slowly and very quietly. I guess we'll need a bigger knife. He answered sarcastically. It's not the size that matters, I told him. Dear, it's, it's the edge. The size is what matters, he screamed again, now wielding a butcher knife in front of my nose. <laughs> so you think I should use that knife on the salad, I asked, my voice surprisingly calm. He probably shouldn't have stuck the butcher knife in the cutting board between the red radishes and the red tomato. He had misplaced all his manners by this point. Not that I'm saying that I was in my right mind, but at that precise moment, I still seemed to be in control of myself. My hands weren't shaking, and I still didn't know that this was one of the best days of my life. My voice didn't break once as I said, Edmund, I think I need a moment alone. <laughs> so who's keeping you here, he asked. <laughs> Suggesting a lack of basic skills for a career in diplomacy. <laughs> I mean alone in the kitchen, I emphasized. He looked like a little boy who had just been scolded. The way he sulked and, and stormed off made me feel a twinge of kindness again. Maybe it was going to be all right, but my stomach was tightening up and I didn't like that. A glass of milk was just what the doctor ordered. So I poured a tall one, and I started to drink. <laughs> the milk helped calm my nerves. A few deep breaths, and I would be fine, just fine, if only he hadn't chosen that moment to return to the kitchen. And if only he hadn't said, milk is a sauce. <laughs> For cereal, you're not supposed to drink it. It's a vomitous thing to do. If only I hadn't had the butcher knife in my hand. As I said at the trial, it was It was an impulse. 
I don't, say, I don't say things like irresistible impulse. It was just an impulse. I didn't want any special defense. I don't respect people who do that. I told my lawyer that I wouldn't accept an insanity plea. George is sympathetic to women in cases like this anyway. I deserve time in prison. I want to be punished. I wouldn't even mind if they took my life, but everyone seems certain that they won't do that. I don't think that Edmund deserved to die. I should have divorced him. Divorces are made in heaven. They are what make America strong. But right after my late husband said, milk is a sauce, one time too many, I decided to express my displeasure in the most forceful manner open to me. Until my dying day, I will have some respect for him, not for his being Canadian, not for his ability to turn Greece into a semblance of food. I respect him for the last words out of his mouth as my butcher knife carved his yielding flesh in the late afternoon sun and his blood added a new shade of crimson to the tomato and the radishes. His last words were, that's the wrong knife. <laughs> When I read this story to Sam, Sam said it's truly a horror story. This rational guy who has all the right positions <laughs> being destroyed like that by his useless, faithless wife. It is a horror story. If only you'd had a happy ending. <laughs> with that in mind and with the fact that Mr. Samuel Edward Conkin III always stuck to his guns, whether they were loaded or not. <laughs> I propose this final toast to one of the most interesting friends I've ever known, Samuel Edward Conkin III. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Kent. Well, uh, on the day that uh, Sam died, okay, well, I'm getting feedback over here. I uh, went on the left libertarian list that Sam founded and uh, posted the, uh, the news and uh, then proceeded to, uh, you know, take over the list and make plans and try to, you know, solicit comments and uh, <clears throat> started to think about what, you know, we're going to do with things like the Agorist Institute and, uh, you know, looking back in history at other movements like uh, the Objectivist Movement, uh, we all know how fond he was of the Libertarian Party, uh, which is known as the LP. And I noticed that Leonard Peikoff's initials are LP. So I thought that I would be, you know, since I'm assistant director of the Agoras Institute, you know, and I pretty much tried to live this book for a while as a catechism, that perhaps I could be the LP of Agorism. <clears throat> and I, you know, but then I started thinking about people who were deviationists and. Uh, you know, I just had to start purging people. Like, Sam took this picture of me that, uh, that was really sabotaging, and, and it was a lying picture that made me look kind of fat. So, um, he's purged. Uh, Neil took one, made me look like Lord of the Rings or Jabba the Libertarian or something. So, you know, he's out of here. <clears throat> so, pretty much, I'm about the only one left that's the, uh, the true uh, center of agorism. So, uh, it, it, you know, Leonard Peikoff is he's the, the for, world's foremost authority on the philosophy of objectivism. So I guess that I'm the world's foremost authority on the philosophy of agorism now, I guess. <laughs> it's like the uh, Monty Python movie where the, the old guy's sitting alone and everyone's pointing at him. Oh, he, he's the popular front. And, and everyone's looking at him and they're saying, Splinter. So, well, I thought I'd... Uh, read uh, a little bit of uh, Anarchia, where this is one work of fiction that uh, Brad didn't read yet, <laughs> but, or in which uh, Sam is a, a character, or at least appears, his name appears. So I don't know, let's see here. How far I went to it, I want to go. I'm going to skip way ahead of this. Uh, um, okay, we basically have uh, Ernest Hemingway, we have um, uh, an anarchist who's come in and, and left, and um, we have this uh, pulp uh, science fiction writer named uh, Howard Davidson, who uh, wishes he was as good as E.E. E. Doc Smith. And uh, speaking of the Honda Zwilnik that uh, I used to have, which is a, a, a Smith reference. And 
So basically, uh, okay, Chesterton is describing what the distributists are doing in Spain to help the anarchists, and Hemingway is puzzled. He despises the church, speaking about Derudi. Hemingway broke the news, but his listeners evinced no surprise. You must be performing miracles right out of the Bible if you expect to ally yourself with him. We are not a religious group, Chesterton corrected Hemingway. Our two groups have Christians of different denominations, as well as religious Jews and even a few atheists. But there are no communists, Nazis, or fascists. What is this other group called, asked Hemingway. Our American colleagues call themselves agorists, said Chesterton. Unlike we poor distributists, the agorists have a lot of money, said the Cockney girl <laughs> who was with him. I've heard of them, Davidson added his two cents. They even have an institute. The leader is a Canadian eccentric named Konkin. FDR and the New Dealers have been trying to get him through the IRS. The feds assume he must be one of the richest men in America, because, but nothing sticks. He only appears in public to dine at the finest restaurants and then disappears again. I won't ask how he is financing your brigade, said Hemingway. <clears throat> Gold, Chesterton volunteered. Much of this world war is being financed uh, by gold on both sides. <clears throat> Hemingway let that sink in. Whether building a new world or preserving an old one, there was no getting away from the curse of Midas. He had many friends who had hidden away golden coins and family heirlooms when Roosevelt had tried collecting all the gold in 33. He didn't doubt that many Germans did the same thing when Hitler tried to pull the same stunt in the same year. <clears throat> anyway, so we're uh, FDR and Hitler being equated. You know, this is going to be the joy of this. No. There's all, all sorts of good things like that. And uh, I must say that working on Anarchia, well, first of all, I must say that without Sam, <clears throat> I, I, we wouldn't have Alongside Night or Rainbow Cadenza or uh, Jehovah Contract or Solomon's Knife. I mean, uh, many, any of the people here that have become published authors, you know, got their start in New Libertarian Magazine or, you know, uh, well, what was the thing in that he was doing in college in the 70s, or, you know, right, Lousy Fair, yeah, right, so New Libertarian <laughs> Weekly uh, gave, you know, was like the training wheels for a lot of us. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, the <clears throat> I just see all these wonderful uh, works coming out uh, that owe their existence to uh, Sam. And so I just like to say thanks, and uh, a nice little souvenir, too. So. All right, thanks. <laughs> uh, next, I'm going to uh, invite up a man who wrote an excellent article about uh, Sam's influence as a publisher and as a writer, Jeff Riggenbach. I see the logistical problem here. Can you folks hear me in the back? Do you want me to raise it a bit? Anybody can't hear me in the back. OK, then I'll assume you can. Um, a few days ago, when I uh, first began uh, making some notes on what I felt I would like to say at this gathering, I found my mind returning uh, over and over to the opening paragraph of Mark Twain's great novel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with this book, but probably, unlike me, most of you haven't taken a look at it in a while. I went back and reread that opening paragraph to find out why it uh, kept popping into my mind as though it was somehow relevant. And uh, I'll uh, read you the first few sentences. You don't know about me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain, and he told the truth mainly. <laughs> there was things which he stretched, but mainly he told the truth. Now, in my own much less important writing, I've tried to follow Mr. Mark Twain's example. A few weeks ago, for example, when I prepared an obit on Sam for publication on the libertarian website rationalreview.com, I was guided by Mr. Mark Twain's example. I think Sam himself was guided by Mr. Mark Twain's example, consciously or unconsciously, during the two decades in which he was actively and frequently publishing one incarnation or another of his flagship periodical, New Libertarian. As we all know, Sam told the truth in New Libertarian, mainly. <laughs> well, as I say, I strove to do the same in my obit, and I felt I did okay. 
But not everyone agreed with me about that. I received some criticism via email from some of Sam's other friends who felt that I had not told the truth in that obit. For the most part, though, what their complaints boiled down to was that I had left certain things out. And, of course, I had. You always have to leave something out in any piece of writing, and particularly when you're trying to sum up in 3,000 words the entire career of a man as protean as Sam Konkin. What a facility with words he had. He was a smooth, entertaining, highly readable writer and a smooth, entertaining, highly listenable speaker. And what a conversationalist. He seemed to know something about almost everything you might bring up, particularly if it had anything to do with political economy. And not just in the United States or North America, but anywhere in the world. He seemed to have read every newspaper published in the world and could cite pertinent examples off the top of his head. I've known only two other people in my life who could talk as knowledgeably and persuasively as Sam, Roy Childs and Murray Rothbard. And that's not bad company to be keeping. <laughs> now, I'll grant you some of that informed, knowledgeable quality that Sam fairly radiated probably came from his great air of confidence, no matter what he was talking about. No matter what subject you might bring up, Sam had a firm opinion on it. And he was firmly convinced that his firm opinion was absolutely correct in its every detail and implication. That air of confidence he had was disarming to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> Listening to him, they were inclined to say to themselves, well, I'm not fully convinced here, but gee, if he weren't right, he couldn't possibly sound so sure of himself. <laughs> now, I hasten to add that what you're hearing right now is very much a case of a pot calling a kettle black. A pot, that seems to be a good name for me, don't you think? When I say Sam convinced a lot of people simply by sounding so confident, I'm fully aware that something similar could be said and has been said about me. Uh, about 30 years ago, not long before I first met Sam, I gave a talk at a now defunct institution called the Los Angeles Libertarian Supper Club. I was introduced to the audience by George H. Smith, who said, you have to be careful listening to Jeff because of his voice. With that voice of his, even if what he says isn't true, it sounds true. <laughs> now, a quality like that can be somewhat exasperating at times. Certainly it was for me in Sam's case. You see, Sam wasn't just confident about agorism, the free market, the counter-economy, and such stuff as that. He was also confident that every human being must sleep no less than 10 hours each night. He was confident that every meal must contain meat. He was confident that all beer must be dark. He was confident that milk is a sauce. He was confident that peanut butter is a garnish. He was confident that Federal Express does not deliver parcels. He even had an argument to support each of these contentions. Now, most of Sam's friends agreed with him about some of these claims and disagreed with him about others. Um, at least that's the way it was for me. And at times, when he was explaining to me why it was in some deep sense wrong to make a sandwich with peanut butter, or why I couldn't send a box of books across the country via Federal Express, I found him a bit hard to take. <laughs> Once again, though, I hasten to add, I mean no disrespect in saying this of Sam. I myself am also exasperating and hard to take. Ask those friends of Sam's who didn't like my obit that ran on rationalreview.com. One of them described me in an email as a snob and a prick. And I have to admit, when he said that, he told the truth, mainly. <laughs> I met Sam in 1975, not long after he arrived in California. I was living here in LA at the time. I really need some water, Neil. Could you do something about that? <laughs> Uh, but the truth is that for about 21 of the 29 years we knew each other, we lived about 400 miles apart. Now that he's gone, far sooner than I had ever expected, I realized what a blessing it was that we found ways to visit each other. I frequently came down to L.A. on business or pleasure and almost always found a way to work Sam into my schedule. 
he came up to the Bay Area at least once or twice in most of the years that we knew each other and stayed with me as a not infrequently exasperating but always very welcome house guest on more occasions than I can count. His loss is truly irreplaceable. I'd like to leave you with a few observations about Sam that I doubt you'll hear from anyone else at this gathering. Observations that, when I first made them publicly nearly 20 years ago at a conference here in Los Angeles, were greeted with a certain enthusiasm. It was 1986, and the event was a roast of Samuel Edward Conkin III at an event called, as I recall, Dagny's Con. It was run by a very energetic lady named Dagny Sharon, who is now, I believe, living on an island in the Caribbean and was unable to be with us today. In any case, I told the assembled multitude at the roast that although many people gave Sam plenty of credit for certain of his accomplishments, for creating agorism and the Agorist Institute, for publishing New Libertarian, for promoting libertarianism to science fiction fans and science fiction to libertarians, uh, and for directly inspiring an entire group of immensely talented, award-winning libertarian science fiction writers. But no one, to my knowledge, had ever acknowledged another of Sam's undeniable accomplishments, namely that he was, as I put it in that long-ago roast, the Lewis Carroll of the libertarian movement. Now, it might well be wondered just what the hell I meant by that. Lewis Carroll, as many of you know, was a professor of mathematics and symbolic logic at Oxford. He was also a pioneer photographer and was much taken with little girls. In fact, it was for a little girl, the daughter of the dean of his college at Oxford, that he wrote the two books for which he's mainly remembered, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. Now, Sam wasn't, to my knowledge, much interested in little girls, uh, nor was he much of a photographer, though that was one of the many crafts he did practice. The reason I say he was the Lewis Carroll of the libertarian movement was because of his penchant for and a talent at neologism, a penchant and a talent that he shared with Lewis Carroll. Consider a brief poem by Carroll, perhaps the uh, best known of all the poems he wrote, Jabberwocky. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the momraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snickersnack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou, hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kalu, kalay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the momraths outgrabe. Now at the time this was written, in the early 1870s, chortle was not recognized by the Oxford English Dictionary as a legitimate word in use by speakers and writers of English. Neither was galumph, neither was burble. Now all of them are, and this does not exhaust Lewis Carroll's neologisms. Sam had his own coinages, which everyone in this room, I'm sure, is familiar with. There was party arc, for example, originally coined to describe anarchists who were working with the Libertarian Party. There was coctopus, which was used to describe the network of organizations uh, controlled and financed by Charles Koch and his family, which uh, began to exercise a certain dominance in the Libertarian movement during the late 1970s and early 1980s. And perhaps uh, most impressive of all, the cluster of words, minarchy, minarchist, minarchism, to describe the libertarian position of a desire for a small, extremely limited government, usually the sort of government that Ayn Rand advocated in her writings, to uh, uh, distinguish uh, this sort of libertarian from the kind who was an anarchist. You have an anarchist and a minarchist. 
These words caught on very quickly. Within 10 years of Sam's coinage of them in the late 1960s, you were finding them in places like Newsweek. Ordinarily, the language does not change that fast. And the way that lexicographers discovered that the language is changing is by checking dominant periodicals in the marketplace, places like Newsweek, if words make their way into a magazine of that sort, what it tells us is that the word is becoming accepted. This is no small thing. Sam will be remembered, I think, for many things, protean talent that he was. I think one of them will be for his contributions to our language. There, I think I've told the truth, mainly. I've said on previous occasions that um, that one of the things which, uh, which Sam did for me personally uh, was open up a world to me. Sam took me to my first science fiction convention. He took me to my first meeting of the C.S. Lewis Society in New York City and then later uh, out here in, uh, when they formed here in California. He, we went to, the, uh, to LASFIS together. He, uh, we went to the, um, uh, to the NASFIC uh, out here shortly after we arrived here. Um, and as a consequence of my appearing in New Libertarian Notes, and particularly uh, Sam serializing my full interview with uh, Robert Heinlein in 1973 and 1974 in, in uh, New Libertarian Notes, I met a number of people who I never would have met, and several of them are sitting in this room. Uh, two in particular, uh, right there, are Victor Komen and Brad Lineweaver, who I, it, the circumstances never would have come about for me, to, uh, for, for me to meet these people if I had not been traveling w with Sam. And so my next speaker is one of the um, denizens of the Anarcho Village, uh, whom I would not have met, and I, my life would have been uh, immeasurably uh, impoverished thereby if I hadn't, Victor Komen. Hey, is this thing working? Uh, first, I have a, a message from Bill Patterson of the uh, of the Heinlein Society, longtime libertarian, longtime science fiction fan. Uh, this was sent to Brad, who asked me to interpolate it because, uh, uh, as an erstwhile member of the OTO, uh, Brad assumed, uh, or yeah, I would know what uh, Bill is talking about. <laughs> Sam Konkin had a very good mind, as I'm sure many others gathered here will assure you. Though it wasn't his mind for which we owed him. Oh, it might have been if he'd completed his counter-economics, as so many of us had urged him to do over the years. But that would have been uh, uh, Trump's minor stuff, a playing with pentacles over there with the other staves and cups and coins, especially coins. Instead, he had set himself a much harder task. He was going to live in the major arcana, not the magician or the hierophant, though he often wore those masks. No, Sam Konkin was a living Trump zero, divine fool, forever stepping off a precipice the rest of us were too wise to dare. Don't go there, Sam, we warned him repeatedly over the years. And your little dog, too. But he knew where his path lay. Sam went where we would not, and he lived in a strange and unknown unknowable land. Now he goes where we do not, a bellwether for us no less now than he was in life, making smooth the way for the great day. Signed, Bill Patterson. Uh, as uh, has been pointed out here, uh, Sam was a great fount of ideas that he would just toss off uh, casually, just uh, all he'd be tamping his pipe, and he'd go, hmm, you know, if, uh, if uh, all those Catholics that object to abortion would just go around to the uh, abortion clinics and scoop up the fetuses and uh, raise them uh, uh, to adulthoods, uh, you know, then they'd have this army of, of, uh, of loyal servants. Uh, and and it, <laughs> And uh, just from that offhand comment of his, I, I wrote Solomon's Knife, which I'd like to read in its entirety. <laughs> I met Sam also in 1975. I think 1975 was a bellwether year for, uh, 
for a lot of us because that was when uh, Sam and Neil and, and uh, Bob Cohen and Andy Thornton and uh, a little earlier Charles Curley made the uh, great pilgrimage uh, from New York to California where they uh, wound up staying for, uh, you know, for till now. <laughs> and uh, it was a strange year for me. I was living uh, across the street from UCLA in a uh, converted sorority house, which was the only non-sorority sorority house on Sorority Row, Hillgard Avenue. And I was living in a converted women's restroom, <laughs> which uh, had pink carpeting and uh, pink flocked walls and uh, two toilets and two sinks, so it was very convenient for me, uh, <laughs> but very cramped. And I had, I had uh, the year before, when I was going to San Jose State, gone to the bookstore there and picked up a copy of something called The Alien Critic. I don't recall why I picked it up. It was a Richard E. Geis's fanzine. Uh, but as I was looking through it, it had an ad in the back for a magazine called New Libertarian. And it uh, was advertising an interview with uh, Robert A. Heinlein. So I thought, that, well, this was really cool. I like Robert A. Heinlein. Uh, I don't know what this word libertarian means, but I think it's associated with Heinlein in some way. So I, I ordered uh, a, the, uh, a copy of the magazine, and I just casually mentioned that, um, you know, I had, read, uh, um, I had read Atlas Shrugged or something like that. And I got this uh, three-quarter page typed letter from him, along with the magazine, explaining the difference between libertarianism and objectivism and, uh, and so on and so forth, which I thought was unusual when you just send in a, you know, subscription. <laughs> but Sam was like that. And, and, and that's, how, that's how we started to get to know each other. And, and practically the second letter he wrote to me was, you know, we're going to be moving out to California. How about if we, uh, you know, come by and visit? Uh, you know, maybe you can scout out some places for us to stay. Uh, so I said, well, sure, come out. He was very energetic. I, I didn't know anything about what he looked like. Uh, he, uh, but he was always talking about, uh, you know, black flags and black banners and black clothes. And uh, I figured he was black. I, I, I had this, I had this image of this this crazed uh, black anarchist, you know, about you know six foot three, with uh, you know wild hair, skinny as as anything, in a, in a, an army jacket, you know, ranting and raving and, and swinging a black banner. Um, and so when I met him, and in saunters like Bob Hope, this uh, this this calm. Uh, laid-back guy with, you know, slightly, uh, slightly pudgy, you know, with a pipe in hand, uh, very casual. Uh, I said, ah, okay, uh, you know, uh, don't judge a, a, a book by its, uh, by its cover. So we, we hit it off immediately. I mean, we, uh, when, when Alan uh, spoke of, of Sam's early life, and I think a lot of us have shared this with Sam, you know, uh, reading science fiction all the time, uh, you know, science geek, uh, you know, uh, unpopular in school, bullied. I didn't figure out the thing of uh, writing the papers for the biggest bully and, uh, you know, having him be your protector. Uh, I, I wish I'd known that. It, it would have saved me a, a lot of hassle. But uh, there was something about Sam that, that energized us. Uh, we, we, immediately fell into this whole anarcho-village uh, sort of anarcho-volume or whatever you want to call it. Um, and we were, he had us, you know, churning out a weekly newsletter, getting it printed, getting it laid out, getting it folded, getting it stuffed and stamped and sealed, uh, you know, until our tongues were bleeding. Uh, it, it, it was a great time. And from that sort of bohemian uh, world, we uh, branched out and uh, you know created our own lives for ourselves, our own identities, uh, independent of Sam, uh, which annoyed him greatly. But um, uh, he was very proud of us, and uh, we were very proud of him. And I, I think that um,
real genius isn't recognized right away. It's like a classic book or a classic song or a classic film. You'll know it by its longevity. and by the influence it has on subsequent generations. I think Sam's influence on subsequent generations uh, will be profound. One, sometimes when the personality is no longer there, the words and the ideas finally come through and shine. And I think it'll be that way with Sam. Thank you. Chris Schaefer, the founder of the Anarcho Village. Well, I figured if I didn't say anything, then it'd be considered high treason. Uh, actually, what Dana said earlier it has a certain amount of truth to it. When I came down to Long Beach, he was the fellow that drove me around in his like little VW bug. And we went to one place on Walnut, and I was almost, I was tired of looking for an apartment. And I, was, I said, oh, this is okay. And then I said, no, 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 no. Get back in the bug. We'll find a, a place. So we drove north on Walnut to 7th Street. And then we made a right turn onto 7th Street. We were driving along. And all of a sudden, we saw this for rent sign. And he went, no. And he pulled his little bug in right in front of this uh, uh, apartment setup. And the guy uh, took me into the back and showed me this huge two-bedroom apartment. And I was looking at the whole thing. and. I was saying, well, yeah, and uh, how much is this? And uh, he said, 100. And I said, 100 a week? And he said, no, 100 a month. See, in those days, the dollar bought something cause, <laughs> because uh, a little studio that um, one, of the, uh, one of the other Anarcho Village people lived in, and when I first moved in, it was $30. I don't know what it was when he moved in. It might have been 50 or even 75, but the... Uh, the apartment that Sam lived in was like going for $50 when I moved in. So everything was really dirt cheap. So Dana said, take it. So I asked the manager, can I get an application and fill it out? And I did that. And then I said, if you approve of it, I'd like to call my parents and tell them that I've got an apartment and that I'm all squared. And I understand later from talking with one of the other tenants, that was the factor that got me the apartment, that I was willing to call my parents right there on the spot. And then I was talking to, I called my mom and dad up, and then I said, I'd like you to talk to the managers. They were old people, I don't want to say with one foot in the grave, but they were old, old people enough to be my, my parents. And they were called mom and pop affectionately. Well, uh, they were overjoyed to talk to my parents, and they said, don't worry, Mr. and Mrs. Schaefer, we'll take good care of your son. Well, eventually they moved out, and I inherited the job as manager. And I guess, I don't know how long after I was the manager, but uh, not that much long afterwards, Dana called me and said, do you have any extra units there? I've got four people coming out from New York City. Can you, can you set them up? And I said, well, yeah, I, I think I can. And it just happened we did have four units available. So I, I said, OK. I, called the landlady up and I said, take those units off the market. I've got four bodies coming in from New York City in the next two days, two or three days. And then they, they came in and I facilitated the whole ball of wax and got them all moved in. And I looked like a good guy as a result. And I think, um, I think Sam bought dinner that night. I went to some place on, I don't know, some restaurant, I think on Lakewood Boulevard or something. And, uh, uh, we had we all had supper to celebrate the fact that they were all moved in. Well, just one little small note about Sam, two small notes. I don't know if you all believe in numerology, but I found this really strange because he first moved into apartment three. Subsequently, when, uh, um, uh, wait a minute, I'm having an SM moment here. Um, when um, the person that was in six, that was, um, uh, Neil, Neil, when he moved, uh, when he had sold his Twilight Zone thing in his book, he moved out. So six was vacant. So Sam moved from three to six. And then subsequently to that, then he moved to apartment nine, which was the old 
my original two-bedroom apartment that I had. And I, by then I was living in, uh, in um, Victor's apartment, which was four. And things moved around quite, quite, quite. <laughs> Well, I got everything. I got everything going, but uh, and then uh, so Sam. So then, f <coughs> excuse me, from the uh, apartment nine, Sam moved into the house, and then, not to make a long story short, it's already too long now. But there is some personal things going on where Sam had to depart rather rapidly, and they had some real expletive deleted people running the property, not, not the owner of the property, but some property management firm. And they wanted to, um, they wanted to seize everything. Well, I, I wasn't going to have any of that. I was, so I, what I did was I was still semi-manager still. So I called Victor up and I said, come on over and get what you can. And I had secured most of the stuff that I could in one of the garages. And the guy was carrying on about this and that. and said, we got to do this until he comes back to Long Beach. I said, listen. He's not coming back to Long Beach ever again. The Jews will forgive Hitler before he comes back to Long Beach. <laughs> get, the, get the picture. And, uh, but this guy was, he had no concept of history or anything. And he said, the law is the law. And I just I said, OK, but by then, I had saved 90% of Sam's stuff into the garage. And so that's that. The other thing, one of Sam's wonderful schemes, I say it's a scheme because I don't know if it really ever worked. One of the ways he was going to pay the rent was, on one of his many, many credit cards, he was going to go on the first of the month, buy a whole bunch of gold bullion, and then at the end of the month, on credit, you see, and then, and then at the end of the month, he was going to sell the gold, use the profit from that to pay, to pay the rent. Anyway, Sam was a great guy, and I'm sure as heck going to miss him. So I guess the next guy is Ernie. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, introduce yourself first, and then we'll have it on the right. My name is Zerny. I, uh, I moved into uh, that complex that became known as the Anarcho Village pretty much right out of, uh, you know, right out of high school. Um, they say it usually begins with Ayn Rand, the uh, book title. Um, Jerome Tuchil, I believe. Well, I read that. Um, uh, you know, in the closing months of high school, and found myself plopped down into this little community, this little nexus of science fiction and you know, science fiction fans who also happen to be libertarian, which I suspect is most of them. Um, and as much as Ayn Rand, I would have to say that uh, Sam was a uh, primary forming influence in, in my own character. Um, the man was, oh, I'm struggling for a word here. The man was as, was, well, it was, hmm, I've lost that word forever. Uh, Make up one. It's the most traditional. <laughs> <laughs> His place was a place that you could go and have a, you know, an hours long or extending even on, onto days long conversation. Um, congenial, that's the word I wanted. And I know that Sam didn't carry the sporting chromosome, um, but I think that he would have made it. A, I think he would have made an incredible coach because he could he could motivate people to go that extra mile to get that extra play in whatever it is. I remember one particular Boxing Day party in which um, I'd never engaged in a drinking contest in my life, <laughs> but I found myself being coached by him. <laughs> as it were, encouraged to, there was one, there's, there's a particular guy at this, at this boxing day party whose name escapes me, um, never saw him again after I left the Anarcha Village, but he was a very large guy, red-headed ex-marine, fairly loud individual, 
who boasted that no one could ever put him under the table, and Sam wanted to see if it was possible. <laughs> and me being the callow youth I was, um, <laughs> suffice it to say that he got carried out, not me. <laughs> I woke up after the, when I woke up the next day, the party was still going on well into the next day. So, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Lorraine Tudahasi. I met Sam. 1977 or 78, uh, in written form, in uh, Las Fapa, which was a Los Angeles-based apple, which is still going. I met him in person, I think, in 1978. We were never very close, but every time we got together, we got into a political argument. He shaped my political beliefs. I didn't end up agreeing with him, but he helped shape my beliefs. Uh, the one thing that we could never come to an agreement about was, I'm allergic to tobacco smoke, and he told me it was all in my head. <laughs> anyway, uh, the real reason I came up here is a woman named Judy Bemis lives in North Carolina. She wanted to be here, but she couldn't, so she sent me something to read. She says, one of my fondest memories of Sec 3 was when I was working on the bid that became the 1992 World Science Fiction Convention. I was helping to throw bidding parties, and at one in Washington, D.C., Sam and Brian Burley competed to give our bid the best beer. Brian supplied the lager, and Sam supplied the dark. But they made it a contest of sorts. Another thing I remember and will miss in the future was Sam's alternative Worldcon daily newsletter, the Daily Free Fanzine. In recent years, it became very slick with digital photographs of friends he saw. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is. My name is Michael Shaw. I had the um, privilege of meeting Sam in the early 70s. I believe it, it was at the, the apartments of Gary Greenberg and people who were starting to form the Libertarian Party, Walter Block. And before I forget, I want to send regards from Gloria and Ray Strong from uh, San Jose, who, are, uh, who feel the loss of Sam very deeply. They couldn't make it to it, but they're in San Jose. I, um, I just want to share some happy memories of Sam. When, uh, when I had a typesetting business in New York, uh, some of the needs of, of our customers fit right in with Sam's lifestyle because he was a night person, as we all know. So we, he'd work um, his usual hours of midnight to whenever, you know, or, uh, and uh, get the type ready and walk them over. We were in 46th Street, West 46th Street in Manhattan. He'd just walk them over to the artists, drop the type off under their door. Everybody was happy. Next day, you'd see occasionally a Macy's ad or, or something else in the newspapers. So th these were pretty happy, um, happy times. Uh, when we reacquainted, we actually came out at about the same time in 1975. And then, um, uh, through the various supper clubs and the various iterations of supper clubs, I had uh, Sam introduced me to Mike Eberling. I knew Neil from New York, I'm pretty sure, right, from New York. You maybe have introduced me to Sam, is that right? I think I got him to be your typesetter. <laughs> it could be. Well, you know, my senior moments are getting closer and closer together. Uh, when, um, when I started um, house cleaning service here 22 years ago, uh, Sam set the type for, for many of my coupons. Actually, coupons have been sent out in the millions. Actually, Sam did the typesetting for that. Actually, Sam helped, I met Ken Hastings through Sam. And of course, through the supper club, I met Victor and Brad, you know, you know I met, met these people. If I didn't play bridge on Monday nights, I'd be there far more often. 
but uh, I, I love it whenever I, when I, ever I come. Now, w one of the things that Sam and I, uh, we started a little business where he did um, uh, resumes. So we've had a lot of business contact, and um, I, I, my main memory of Sam is, besides his obvious extreme intelligence, is as I put in the, down in the book that I signed, he was a person of rare benevolence. Rare benevolence. I will never forget that. He he could really be a role. I guess is a role model to me. I I hope I can f remember him and help me do some some good. Um, one favorite uh, people who went to his apartment after the Libertarian Supper Club maybe remember this one example of his wit. He said, uh, "Non smokers will, will be allowed." <laughs> 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 and. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I'll miss you, Sam. Thank you. Yeah. I met uh, Sam in uh, New York. Uh, can you give me a name for his Bob? My name is uh, Bob Cohen. And I met Sam in uh, New York uh, when I was working for the Department of uh, Social Services. And I was reading a book called Morris and Tanner, uh, Market for Liberty by Morris and Linda Tannehill, which was influenced by uh, Murray uh, Rothbard. Ever since I met Sam, I hung out uh, with him and um, had to leave my, uh, my uh, uh, sinful way of uh, life. Uh, when he decided to move to California, I decided to go with him. I gave up a civil service job with job security and a steady income to come out to California. And I've been struggling ever since. <laughs> and the funniest thing is, is that I've never regretted it. The struggle is everything. And um, his brand of libertarianism is that uh, we could uh, uh, free ourselves uh, from uh, the, uh, the state without the uh, politics. And um, he inspired me to uh, do that on, on the internet uh, through uh, my uh, website uh, called reclaimyourpower.com. It's a way of uh, self-liberation. It's another form of counter-economics that, uh, that uh, I learned uh, from uh, Sam. I was very surprised uh, that uh, when I uh, heard he uh, left his uh, body. I'm going to miss him uh, very much. He's a big inspiration uh, with me, and uh, he's uh, created a whole generation of uh, freedom builders and science fiction writers and uh, writers of all kinds and people who work uh, uh, to uh, free themselves, inspire others to uh, free themselves. And that's the way we're going to free uh, uh, ourselves and free society. And the free market uh, will uh, become the dominant way of life in this uh, country and in the world. That's it. Neil. Manny Klausner is my name. I know many of you are here, and I've been uh, very moved by uh, and entertained by the comments here about this remarkable Sam E. Konkin that has uh, just left us. Uh, so let me speak up a little bit so people can hear. Uh, I, got, I, I believe I met Sam originally at one of the uh, future freedom conferences at USC in the uh, either late 60s or early 70s. I'm not sure exactly when Sam came out here, but it was in the early 70s. As many of you know, I was involved in the early days of uh, Reason Magazine out here and also the Libertarian Party. So Sam and I crossed paths intellectually and ideologically on a lot of fronts. And I was always a fan of Sam's in, in a lot of ways. I, I admired his brilliance. I loved, he had, he had a, a, such a, uh, a congenial is the word, but also a very appealing personality. He had great passion, which I love, and he was very principled, which I love, very opinionated, that's me too. And uh, a great champion of liberty. And uh, really, uh, as we see from the the friends and fans here, 
uh, had a profound influence on many people, and he did it with, uh, with the brilliance of his mind, and he did it with a twinkle in his eye. And uh, he really liked people, he respected people who loved liberty, and even people who didn't agree with him necessarily, which was a lot of people on every issue, or many issues. Uh, he still had respect. He respected people who disagreed with him, and I like that trait as well. Um, the, the comment was made earlier about you know, who gets credit for, for liberation of the Soviet Union and, and uh, the collapse of communism, and was it Sam or was it Reagan? And actually, I think in Sam's mind, it certainly was Sam, because, you know, look, Counter economics, where did it prevail? Where was the greatest success of counter economics? It was the black market and Soviet Union. Well, if you have all these libertarians practicing counter economics, that's it. Sam gets total credit in my book. Uh, Sam, uh, there's a, a few comments about Sam. And, you know, we talked a little bit about a comment that was made about numerology. And, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily a great believer in astrology, but if you live in California, you have to take note of the day that Sam was born. And what happened on that day? And it turns out, on July 8th, uh, 1947, which, by the way, uh, 1947 had to be, happened to be a great year in Bordeaux. It's a great year, you know, in France, generally for wine. Now, Sam didn't like milk, except as, as a sauce. I understand that, you know, burnt toast. You know, better to have, uh, you know. Uh, but, but see, we, had, we didn't agree on everything, but he still enjoyed what he did and, 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 with a passion. But well, who was born on the day uh, Sam was born? There, there, are two, there are two events on his day the, the, uh, the, um, on July 8th that I thought had no. One was the day that Sam was born was the anniversary of the birthday of Count von Zeppelin. Well, we knew Sam always soared. He was de destined to be, have his ideas that would be looking over and having profound influence that people saw something floating up there. So I thought that the fact he was born on Van Zeppelin's birthday is no surprise, but also 1887, uh, July 8th, the day Sam was born in 1887 was the day that the Wall Street Journal was first published. And there's a kind of an interesting omen because Sam was a profound intellect who went to the field of public publishing and journalism. And Wall Street Journal had a profound influence on many people, but because it wasn't counter economics, they made a really a lot of real live money. But Sam has credit card, the float, and the gold bullion, so it wasn't like he suffered. And when we think of all the publications that he did, and one of the little known chapters in the mid 70s, uh, one of the groups that I've been involved with, I'm chairman of a group called the Libertarian Law Council in Los Angeles. And Sam was actually the key, the instrumental person who was responsible for publishing, typesetting our newsletter, Libertarian Law Notes. We had great articles by Alex Kaczynski in the early days, Bernie Siegel, and a lot of Dana Rohrbacher and others. And Without Sam, it would never have gotten out, and certainly his time was great because he picked up the copy late at night, and the next morning it was all done. So uh, Sam really uh, had, had the perfect schedule for us. Sam was... Uh, three lines of type. Three lines of type. No, it was actually three lines per paragraph. No, it was, it was pretty, you know, in the old days when it was still published, uh, Sam got paid by the, the line, and he, he made a few bucks out of it, more than three lines altogether. Uh, what, what else was I going to point You know, I, I think that... Uh, the, 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 of all the friends and admirers and supporters that, that Sam has, and a lot of them are in this room, uh, I was very moved by what Neil Schumann has said about Sam over the years. I, I loved his admiring and, and, and personal uh, uh, obit that, that he wrote that was on the, on the website. Uh, and I think the, the influence that Sam had has really been very profound. I, you know, I think the, the, the struggle for liberty, which we're all involved in, is g g we, we have to be vigilant. It's a never-ending struggle, because even if we succeed, the, our enemies will not go away. And so there are many paths to get to liberty. I have my own, uh, you know, if, if, if you looked only to Sam about the Libertarian Party or about the Reason magazine, <laughs> you learned a lot, but you only got part of the story. And you know, my own view, I was very influenced by Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises and, and others. And I, I, there was a lot of what Sam did that I admired in terms of his ideology, but I never quite, it was sort of like what Jeff was saying about you know, quoting Mark Twain. You know, Sam had a lot of the picture, but most of the time, but it wasn't all of the picture. But I think the, 
The ultimate question for me with Sam and, and many people who like Sam's ideas is when you have a clash between the minarchists and people who believe in limited government, who really treasure liberty and, and uh, choice, and if you're, if you're a believer in counter-economics and agorism, what do you do when you come across a group of individuals who, tre who treasure liberty and want to have a government, and it's choice and consent, they want to have a government, and there's a bunch of people that want a government. What do you do if you're an, ag an, an agorist? Versus if you are a minarchist and you think government is absolutely essential for the preservation of liberty and the culture, what do you do when you get a group of people, say you're in Warsaw Ghetto in you know, early 1940s, and you got a bunch of people that say, I don't want that government. So it's really ultimately a question to me, the cardinal principles and the moral rules that govern all of us are choice and consent. And if people choose to have a government to a person, that, at least for their lifetime, I think we all have to respect the choice of individuals in a free society, and vice versa. If cheap people choose not to have a government, what minarchists could stand in their way? So we look, we respect, we treasure what Sam has done to enrich all of our lives, our intellect, our philosophies, and our struggle. And Sam died on a day that something very significant happened in the struggle for liberty, and that was the flag, the Marines, U.S. Marines, raised the flag on Iwo Jima on the same day that Sam died in 1945. Sam would be proud, I hope, that the flag of liberty wasn't a black flag, but it was a flag that symbolizes liberty in our day, not just for people who believe in counter, the counter economics, not just for new libertarians, but for many people who have fought and lived and breathed and given their lives for liberty. Sam dedicated his life to liberty, and we celebrate Sam and we celebrate the men in black that are here today. Gort, Sam, Barada, Nick, too. <laughs> Thought it was worth a try. <laughs> I'm uh, Vince Miller, I'm president of ISIL, that's International Society for Individual Liberty. Uh, I run it with Jim Elwood over there as VP. Jim, wave your hand. <laughs> I've known Sam for, my God, it has to be 30, over 30 years, probably 33 years. I'm another Canuckian from, from Toronto, you know. I moved to the States too, and I was a Canadian frostback for about eight years too. But uh, I'm legal now. I don't know whether the, I should be proud about that. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, Sam and I sort of kept in touch over the years. I, I, uh, I visited him at, uh, at Anarcho Village, and he's visited us and swilled to Dark Ale, at our place in Benicia, California. I've spoken at the Carl Hest uh, Club before. In, I think it was 85, 1985, we invited Car uh, Sam to speak at our world conference in, in uh, Norway. And I always remember Sam uh, storming up and down in the back of the room. The speaker that, uh, of that day was um, uh, Carl Hagen, who was a member of parliament in the Norwegian parliament. And Sam was, was, was strolling up, was not strolling, he was marching back and, back and forth and snorting with derision, you know, <laughs> while this guy was speaking. And, uh, as it turned out, he, he turned out to be a populist and, uh, and just forget the libertarian label. So uh, that, that was one experience we had with Sam. And uh, he has been a good friend. I've, I appreciate what he's done over the years. Uh, he's uh, been a good friend of ours. And I appreciated his style. You know, he did uh, deliver his style with humor and, and goodwill. And even against opponents, uh, there was always a joke. And, we appreciated him very much, and we'll miss him a great deal. Thanks. My name is Pam Maltzman. Um, I want to give a few more reminiscences that are more personal with Sam. I've known him since I was about 21. I, I don't remember him looking quite that cute as in that, that photograph or quite that thin over there, but I remember lots of parties over the years. And 
Um, I, at one point, when the, he was in the anarcho village, I was sort of in the anarcho annex a couple miles away, and he did ke try to keep, me, keep, he tried to get me to move in a couple times whenever they had, a, you know, an open unit, and I said, no, 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 I like my apartment better, it's bigger, it's better, and it costs me less money than what you guys are paying, so that's fine. But I always showed up for the parties, particularly the Boxing Day parties. And, of course, I ran what Neil has sometimes referred to as the Fifth Street Mission because I was on Fifth Street where my apartment was and there were some years that I was the only one who could afford to bring food to the party. I would cook a nice big turkey. And I said, everybody, bring side dishes, bring side dishes. Well, one, one, I think one year somebody showed up with a pot of rice and that was about it. And we had a little bit of booze and we had this gi gigantic 30-pound turkey, so we, mo we mostly gnawed on that. But anyway, at, at some point, Sam moved out of Long Beach and I did too eventually and I would still attend his parties. And I decided, well, you know, there's a bunch of bachelors. I guess I counted myself as kind of a bachelor, too. I was unmarried, but I was, like, living by myself. And I remember, you know, the bachelor parties always have lots of beer, I guess lots of carbohydrates. Well, I decided, you know, what these guys really need is some protein. <laughs> so I took it upon myself. For a couple of years, I did cook for the Boxing Day parties. And it was usually ham and turkey. But I had my own so milk as a sauce moment with Sam for one of those parties. I would sometimes sleep on the couch when I knew I had to do something the next day there. And of course, for one of the parties, I did just that. Get up in the morning, and of course, when I make a turkey, I get to eat the giblets because I like them. Okay, nobody else likes them, but I do. Of course, you know, the big bird goes in the oven. So I'm sitting there pulling out various implements and various frying pans to find one that I wanted to fry these things up in. And he gets up and, oh no, he starts yelling at me, you know, you're not supposed to use that pan, you're supposed to use this pan. And, these implements and that, and I'm going, you know, I've been kind of cooking most of my life, and you know, this is what I like to cook with. So we kind of went round and round, and finally did get the turkey in there, and I got to eat my giblets. And we, later on, we did have protein to go along with the, with the booze and the, on all the other stuff. But I did kind of, I guess I sort of shamed more people into bringing food for those couple of years that I was cooking the protein for the party. But anyway, so I, I guess I want to say I, I'm going to miss the parties, you know, I guess. And also now that I'm up out of the area, I'm probably not going to throw any parties you guys are going to come to either. So, And I hope that, uh, actually, one of the things I'd like to hope is that perhaps you can make a copy of, you know, on those DVDs and give it to his son because I think he would appreciate hearing all this stuff about his dad. I know that he couldn't be here today, but thank you all, and we're going to have our memories. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Ann Jackson. I'm a former New Yorker, and uh, I've tried, this is impromptu, but I bet the women here have noticed that there's a, a big omission. It's about Sam and the women. I probably don't know, I'm sure I don't know a lot. It's all kind of secondhand, but when I met Sam, he... <laughs> When I met Sam, he lived in the anarcho slum in New York. Neil might be able to help, but as I recall, one thing about Sam that I heard from some of his women is that he was very, very serious about this. This is not something that he did lightly. I think a lot of us had some, you know, great times with being free, but Sam took his women seriously. And um, I think, you know, of course, no, no state marriage. So the first one that I remember is um, Nina. Can you help me? Do you remember Nina? Nona Aguilar. Nona. Nona Aguilar. And then there was um, my next door neighbor when I moved into, you know, next door to Charles Curley, Beth. And then there's Sheila who gave Sam a baby. And the, and the time I love and remember is when Sam came in with that baby and he was not wearing black. He was wearing one of his colors. I used to do color, color analysis and he was wearing this lovely blue and so, so proud of that baby. And I, you know, I just don't know how that wound out. I, any, anybody have another? Yeah, yeah, but any, yeah. but anyhow, you get the idea and, uh, that's one of the things I admired about Sam. Yes, thank you. Short people do. I'm Teeny Rule. Met Sam in 75, just probably within the week 
that he, Neil, Bob, and Andy arrived in town, met them all at a myth con, knew him ever since, kept pretty much in touch ever since. I have a very favorite food story. Uh -oh. <laughs> Sam loved hot food. He'd send it back until it got hot enough. We were in a Thai restaurant in Phoenix. <laughs> and he kept sending it back saying, yeah, it's all right, but it's just not hot enough. Well, when it got hot enough after the third send back, Sam was the very unlibertarian fashion grabbing everyone else's glasses of water and everyone else's stray liquid because it had finally gotten to him. It was one of those heats that builds on itself as it sits in your mouth. It was the one time I had ever seen Sam have just too much of a good thing. I want to invite all of you. I have a suite over at the Comfort Inn, which is two miles from here, on Normandy 186th Street. All of you are welcome that would like to come by and chat for a while. You just go, if you go out of the parking lot here, you turn right on Torrance, then you go down to Normandy, which is the next major street, turn right, and it's a total of about two miles to Normandy and 186th Street. Please come, enjoy, reminisce. It is in room 214. I was going to also say it is a non-smoking room. And I know that Sam loved smoke, but that's not going to be in that room. So just so that you know, please come. I'm Bernie Zuber, and I've, uh, to follow up on that, uh, Sam used to say, uh, you know, uh, when he had a party, non-smokers uh, welcome or tolerated, non-smokers tolerated, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say about his, his eating habits were mentioned, and uh, one thing that didn't get mentioned was the vitamins that he always took. He always had a Ziploc bag with him with his vitamins, like, looked like hundreds of them. I don't know how many were in there, but he never failed to take those. And he never went to a doctor either. And uh, so, so I, I go to doctors, and uh, one of the last conversations we had was like, oh, he, he would never go to one. Anyway, um, I met uh, uh, Sam and Neil and, and uh, Bob and Andy uh, also that same time in, uh, at, at MythCon. It was a, it was a MythCon, Mythopoeic Society conference in, uh, in Claremont. And it was like the libertarian invasion. You know, you've heard of the British invasion with the Beatles. It was like the libertarian invasion. And I had never met an anarchist before. I always, always get the image of a bomb-throwing anarchist. I couldn't imagine Sam throwing a bomb. I don't know. But like a girl. Yeah, <laughs> whatever, yeah. But anyway, the thing was that uh, he was so well-versed and, you know, he had such great knowledge about politics and economy. And every time I would read something in a newspaper or a magazine about a certain thing either going on now or in the history of Europe, especially Europe, uh, he, knew all, he knew all that stuff. He knew all the names, knew all the, all the political parties, all that. It was really a, fa a great fount of uh, information. And uh, he also was the one who got me into Macintosh computers. Uh, he was hoping, yeah. He had, he had an ulterior motive because he really wanted me to do some artwork online. Unfortunately, I never really got to that point, uh, so I kind of failed him on that. I hope I get to do it sometime, though, because in the last, latest one, he put in uh, Adobe Photoshop, so that I'll try to get used, use that. And uh, another thing was uh, on using his public transportation. I used to drive in those days, but he was the pedestrian, and I'd pick him up. He used to work at night for a uh, porno newspaper in downtown LA, in the Alameda, for east of Alameda. And uh, I've walked a lot around those streets since then, and I know it's perfectly safe, you know, like Ray Bradbury was known to have said that if you step out of your car in downtown LA, you get mugged. Uh-uh. Sam used to say that if he had met a, a mugger on the street, he would have said, oh, a fellow human being. It was, you know, nobody around. So, anyway, thank you. I'm Neil's mother, and I was somewhat of a surrogate mother to Sam from about 1970 to the day that he died. Um, 
Sometimes he used to irritate the life out of me. He uh, would argue with me. Or if I would ask him a question when he was sitting in the back of the car when we were going out to dinner, I would ask a simple question and I'd get a dissertation of which half of it uh, I didn't understand. But I just let him go on and on and on and on. Uh, I lost my eyesight in 1999. And uh, one eye. yes, in one eye. And uh, the thing that I constantly remember about Sam is something that he taught me is that when I, because I used to pour things and it would go all over the place, of course I couldn't, I had no depth of perception. He taught me how to pour from a pitcher or, uh, or a pot or something into a glass without spilling it. And so every time I have some tea or some coffee from a pitcher, Sam is in my mind. And I guess that will be my legacy with Sam for the rest of my life. Thank you. These are going to be our last two speakers because I've been informed by the restaurant they have another party coming in, so we, we're going to have to clear the room at, uh, by 4 o'clock. Hello. Uh, my name is Woody, um, and I'm here as a member of Las Vegas fandom. Um, somebody asked me to point something out that Sam was known to stand outside of a, a good party and warn people that it was a non-smoking party, but that it's her party, so she has that right. Um, and so I wanted to pass that on. Um, I first met Sam two years ago, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, someone said earlier that Sam always had an opinion on something. I have a 20-year-old nephew who's, uh, he's here with me today with his piercings and his spider bangs, and you know, he's into, you know, extreme punk uh, music and such. Imagine my surprise when I introduced them and he and Sam had an incredible conversation about, you know, the latest bands out of Seattle or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, there's another there's a, another story I wanted to share, which um, I think illustrates uh, a lot of other things about Sam that I've heard here. And uh, just so those of you who've known him for far longer than I know that he always did really stick to his guns. Um, I had the opportunity to introduce Sam to the con chair of the first convention he ever went to, which was the '69 uh, St. Louis Con, the World Con in '69. And he, he was in St. Louis for the Libertarian, uh, well, I guess it wasn't, I've been corrected recently, I guess it wasn't a Libertarian party at that time, but I guess that was the genesis of it. But there was some sort of a, of a um, political gathering in St. Louis that week, the same weekend as the Worldcon, so he kind of split his time between both. Well, I, I, he went to a, a house party with me in Las Vegas with uh, a, a couple in Las Vegas who relocated there about 10 years ago. Uh, and the wife, Joyce Katz, was the co-chair of that Worldcon. And I thought I was going to be introducing him to somebody that maybe he'd have some uh, I don't know, respect for or be in some awe of, you know, it was his first convention and all that. Uh, he started, uh, the first thing he did with these people was start arguing about uh, the um, immorality of invitation-only clubs and parties. Now. They were fan of class from New York. Uh, they were part of, um, through the 90s, they started this um, invitation-only group in Las Vegas that only people they were interested in inviting could attend. Uh, and um, so I, I wrote something about Sam that uh, to, know, to meet Sam was not necessarily to love him, but that he never left you wondering what he thought of you. And uh, that, that was certainly true in this case. Um, thank you very much. Oh, I think this is about the right height. I'm usually way too short for anything. My name is Janice Hunter. I've known Sam since about 1981, one of the Future Freedom Conferences. I saw him a lot over the years. I loved the Boxing Day parties. Boxing Day will never be the same without him. Um, I just want to say he was a very, a very intelligent guy, but he never made you feel like you were dumb just because you were, were all right brain and didn't get all that science, science stuff. So that, and he was a gentleman. He was 
He was nice to ladies, that's what, I mean, he liked ladies and ladies liked him, and he was a good friend. And another thing, and people, his son has been mentioned, now, I haven't seen Sam in several years, but we got back in touch, a little bit of email a couple of years ago, and he told me about his son, and I know how Sam has felt about religion and God, but I was, hopefully he wouldn't be too mad at me, I, I was praying that he and his son could be reunited and get to know each other, and I'm really sad that's not going to happen. And we, we're, we're, we're like a library or a, a history of Sam, anyone that knows him that he's ever touched. Um, and hopefully a lot of us, um, some, especially his, clo his closest friends, those of you that have known him for 30 years, We'll be able to share that with with him someday with with um, S E K the fourth, and um, I just I was I'm really shocked and surprised that he's gone. I miss him, and Boxing Day will just never be the same again. I'll turn it back over to Neil. My name is Jim Elwood. I'm with the International Society for Individual Liberty, and I didn't know Sam real well, but I got to meet him several times in over fairly recent years. I always found him uh, to be quite amusing and enter very entertaining and uh, quite knowledgeable about uh, a lot of, uh, especially early movement history, since he was active long before I was. So anyway, I'm here as uh, one of the friends. <laughs> I came out to California with him in my uh, Terra Toyota. I was his uh, chauffeur in New York. And in California, while my uh, to Toyota uh, continued to uh, exist. Hi, this is Dan Tweed, and I met Sam back in the, around 1980 at uh, the first Future Freedom conference I went to, and uh, always got the impression here was a guy that was going to whip out the revolution plans from his back pocket, and uh, just always had a smile and a quick word and a quick wit, and. Uh, he was the hardcore of the hardcore, and lazy fair Sam, wherever you are, and uh, we won't see your like uh, too soon, but uh, maybe soon enough. <laughs> so, Janice, you want to say something? Sure. Um, I've known, um, my name is Janice Hunter. I've known Sam since, um, I met him in 1981, I think, uh, probably at a Future of Freedom conference, and um, what I remember most about him are the Boxing Day parties. He would always have a Boxing Day party, and I looked forward to them, and, you know, it was a chance to see friends, and I'll always remember the apartment in Long Beach with the, all, every wall full of bookcases, and he was always really cutting edge into music, and I remember was, he liked punk rock, and he had that poster of Wendy O. Williams on the wall, and... Oh, that's all I can think of right now, except that Sam was really cool, and I was sh shocked when I heard he was gone, and I'm going to really miss the guy. Oh, I got one other thing. One other thing? Okay. Sam, don't forget to smash the state on the way to the afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bernie Zuber, for your reference. And um, I've, been, uh, I've, I've met Sam through the in the Mythopoeic Society, and then Philosophers, and the Carl Hess Club. Knew him from those places. And um, I don't know what else to say other than the fact that he was a good guy and, you know, helped me out with my computers. He, he's the one who got me into Mac, Macintosh. And I uh, met a lot of people through him and whatever. Okay. And I also wanted to say that he was somebody who really stuck to his opinions. Never, never de deviated from his philosophy. These photos are of Sam in 1983 in his, at his birthday party. And I remember him as a teddy bear, even though he'd like to remember himself, I think, as a radical. And I think these pictures, they just remind me of him and how the sweet side of him, you know, and uh, we'll all miss him. It's wonderful to mem uh, keep good memories of Sam. Met him in 75 when he and Bob and Neil and Andy drove out from New York. Knew him well for almost 30 years. And I'm so glad that I came in from Tennessee. This is Teeny, Teeny Rule Fisher. Well, Sam always told me to, to smash the state. I think those were his great words. And every day you have to do something to smash the state. 
so it's, she just has a good legacy to uh, carry on. So I'm glad uh, people are remembering him. That's it. Well, I've known Sam for 12 years, and uh, he had his office out of my, my office, and we worked together, and uh, he was in the apartment that I had rented when he passed away, and uh, I'm going to miss him quite a lot. All that I can say is that Sam was very different. He loved everybody. He contributed all that he could, and uh, he was a blessing to many because uh, they enjoyed his friendship, and uh, we all supported him in every way that we could. I guess I only knew Sam the last couple of years, but I'm very shocked and saddened at his passing, and uh, it was too soon. Sam was like an uncle to me all my life. He, basically, ever since I was born, I've known him. Um, I miss him terribly. I mean, obviously, I have nothing prepared, so. <laughs> That's... so. We disagreed about whether Macs were better or PCs were better. And I kept insisting that since I use a PC, and since Max only have 10% of the uh, market, that just goes to prove that PCs are better. But uh, Sam kept uh, insisting, no, it's quality, not quantity. <laughs> so, uh, other than that, I did enjoy uh, talking to him. And I had the pleasure of uh, getting acquainted with a Polish chap who knew Sam from the internet. That's the only way he knew him. He never, he never got to meet him, but he was so delighted to, uh, to meet someone who knew Sam in person. And uh, so I, I conveyed that to uh, Sam, and he was delighted that, that his material was being read in, in Poland and other countries. So, but thank you very much. Sure. Well, uh, Sam and I met in 1975 in uh, in Acacia House, which is uh, a, a dormitory in in uh, UCLA, uh, which was a, like a converted women's dorm room. And I lived in a converted bathroom with uh, since it was a used to be a women's uh, um, sorority house not dorm room, but sorority house. Uh, it had uh, pink walls and pink carpets and two toilets, two sinks. Very convenient, but very small. And uh, my first impression of Sam from reading all of his works and all of the, his obsession with the color black and his um, uh, very dynamic writing style was that he must be this hyperactive, uh, tall, skinny black guy in a, in a black army jacket or in, in an army jacket, just, just uh, shouting slogans all the time. So when I met him, and he's this laid back, uh, fish belly white uh, guy from Canada with smoking a pipe and languidly talking about uh, uh, anarchy and the revolution. I was, uh, it was very disorienting, but uh, it, it was an uh, exciting time to be around. We were turning out uh, New Libertarian Weekly. Uh, by the time he got there, he turned New Libertarian Notes into New Libertarian Weekly by 1976 or 77. And uh, every week we would be, you know, printing these things, folding them, mailing them out. Very hectic, uh, very uh, uh, careless <laughs> in, in a lot of the stuff we did. But it was a great time, and he was very inspirational to me. He, um, uh, he inspired my novel Solomon's Knife by just offhandedly saying one day, Say, hmm, uh, you know, with his pipe, hmm, uh, well, why don't, why don't the, the Catholics that are so anti-abortion go around uh, to the abortion factories and scoop up all the uh, fetuses and grow them in uh, decanters and, uh, and uh, give birth to an army of, of, uh, of people that are totally devoted to the church? Well, I took that and, and turned it into a, a very different novel, but uh, the, the idea was there. He was, a, he was a great fount of ideas that would just uh, spew out of him nonstop. And uh, 
the world is uh, has lost uh, a world brain uh, with his passing, and uh, we'll miss him, but we'll keep his uh, his flame shining on. This has been a remarkable afternoon. Um, You know, as I as I said in in my poem at the at the beginning of this, I'm I'm fairly lacrimose and tolerant. I don't I don't want to get weepy, and it would be very easy for me to get weepy. Um, Sam was my best friend for uh, you know for over three you know thirty years. Um, you know, he opened up entire areas of my life to me. Um, I I said in the uh, in in the piece that I wrote, which you can find online at pulpless.com slash sek3, that. Um, I would be living an unrecognizable life in an alternate history if I had not met Sam. I would not have written the books I'd, I'd written. I would not um, be known for the accomplishments which I'm known for. Whatever, if, if I had succe succeeded in becoming a writer at all, uh, they would have been different books on different su topics. And it would, you know, my life would be unrecognizable. And I think that that's probably true for many of us here, I'm certainly gathering that, that Sam's seminal influence um, radiates outward in ways that uh, that we don't yet know the full the full scope of and so um, on behalf of the Carl Hess Club I would like to um, uh, thank you for coming today to remind you that the Carl Hess Club is going to go back to its regular schedule and regular uh, locale for the next meeting which is going to be the third Monday at Marie Callender's in Marina del Rey and I would be delighted that as many of you as possible can, uh, can come to, uh, to the next meeting and future meetings. Um, be sure, if you are not on the email list, uh, to see Mike Everling to make sure that you, uh, uh, that you are apprised of our meetings. Also, I would like to ask for one other favor. Uh, there are many of you who have pictures, videotapes, um, poss possible other uh, you know, memorabilia of Sam, and I would like to gather as much as possible, you know, any, any uh, particular letters, anything like that, for, for history's sake, we'd like to get copies of all of these sorts of things for future documentaries, for future books. Uh, and so uh, please stay in touch with me and make sure that, you know, that you've got all my contact information. You can always find me on the web at jneal.tv, but uh, I, uh, I would like to ask that if you've got anything which, which Sam is uh, par participated in, that we uh, that we gather it in. Thank you all for coming today, and I hope to um, I hope to stay in touch with many of you uh, who I haven't seen for a long time. And it's fabulous seeing you all again. Thank you.